So when I was in the shower washing my hair, I hear Elvis Presley's voice. And he was leaning over the shower door. He couldn't wait for me to, to come out. So he was actually singing to me in the shower. So the two of us were on the show that night in Cleveland. I had to follow him. And I've always told the, uh, the press that if there had been no Elvis, then there could be no Clifford. Everybody wanted to be Elvis Presley. That was the American dream. Elvis is the rebel, the dark stranger who comes in the night and seduces the women. He was just always my favorite voice, my favorite performer, my favorite look. I mean, he's... <clears throat> Elvis had a great voice, you see, and he, he was an innovator. He was different. He, um, he performed, he, he listened to, to uh, R&B, rhythm and blues music that were being performed by black people. And he was the first white man to ever sing like that, to ever make rock and roll records in that way, to sing in that style, which he listened, which he got from listening to black singers. And so did I, same thing. So he's, he was an innovator. And he looked different, you know. The way he looked, the way he moved, the way he sounded was all different to, to anybody else that had, that, had, uh, that had come before him. So he made a huge impression on the world, uh, the world of music especially. So I think, I don't think uh, there are many people that don't like him. You know, I, I, don't, I, I don't think I've ever met a person that said, I don't like Elvis Presley. Nobody's ever, ever said that, you know. Some people love him and some people like him, but nobody, nobody ever says they didn't like him. Elvis Presley was the undisputed king of rock and roll, but in early July of 1954, he wasn't even the prince of rock and roll. He was a shy 19-year-old truck driver who wanted to make a record at a small Memphis studio run by Sam Phillips. He finally got up the courage to come in and tell Marion uh, Kaisku, who worked for me, and the little 706 studio in my little office up front and uh, say that he wanted to make a, a record for his mother, a birthday record. Elvis came back and uh, I just saw the guy and I couldn't refuse him. And I thought, hey, yeah, I'll make you a record, Elvis. You got four bucks. <laughs> but I just simply knew that this guy was as potentially good as any person I had auditioned quote unquote, off of the street. Leaving, I told Elvis, I said, I understand there's a couple of prisoners in the maximum security prison in Nashville that uh, are songwriters. You know, if I find anything that I think uh, maybe you could uh, do something with, I'll call you up and let you know if you leave phone number or how we can get a hold of you. Well, he left it with, um, with Marion Kaisku, who worked part time for me. I was the only other employee at that time. We were just talking about the music in general, what, what would be good to try, what style, what people were, re were releasing on record. And uh, she turned to Sam and said, what about that boy that was in here about a year ago that cut the essay for his mother? And uh, Sam said, yeah, uh, best I remember it, the guy had a pretty good voice. So for the next two, three weeks, every day I'd go in there, I'd ask him, I said, did you get a hold of that guy yet? bring him in, whatever. No, no. He finally, again, we were having coffee, and I'd asked the question, he told Marion, go get his name, address, everything out of the file. Because she had kept it. She was the one that had kept, kept his name. And he gave it to me, and I said, uh, why don't you call him and uh, ask him over to your house and see what you think about him. Which I did. And uh, as soon as I got home, I called him. He came over the next day, which was Sunday. We spent a couple hours. Seemed like he knew every song in the world. Didn't know the chord, all the chords on guitar, but uh, he knew, knew the lyrics of most of them. Bill Black lived just a few doors from me, and he came down and listened a while, left. Then after Elvis left, I called Sam and uh, relayed to him. I said, kid's got uh, good timing, knows a lot of songs, and he said, he doesn't have any original material. Sam said, well, said, I'll call him and get him to come in the studio tomorrow night. I said, just you and Bill come in. I don't need the whole band. But all I need is a little background, little background noise. So I knew Scotty Moore had a lot of patience. Bill Black was the best 
upright bass, slap bass player. And I didn't want a bunch of people with Elvis, because Elvis, you'd had to know him at that time. Fewer people you could have working with him that would get to understand him and he wouldn't be quite so frightened at him. And so Scott and Bill uh, is the one I picked and they worked back and forth and would come in and they wouldn't have it. And so, I don't know, after the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth time and for an audition after we decided this song that I found in Nashville was just another ballad. Mm, we were about ready to sack everything up that night and come back again later on. And what happened was, is uh, Scotty had put up his guitar, Bill had laid the old bass down. I'd come out of the control room into the studio, and Elvis still had his uh, flat top, Martin guitar around his neck, and he cut down on That's All Right Mama. When I heard it, it just broke me up. I mean, I said, golly, what a version of, of a rhythm and blues thing almost a gut bucket thing, but with the tempo up, it became a quote-unquote a rhythm and blues thing. This was strictly an audition. And uh, the audition came before the first side of the record. Scotty Moore, I don't know if Scotty Moore realizes how important he was for Elvis, and indirectly for the Beatles and any Rolling Stones, etc. as well. A guy like Scotty Moore, who played a certain style of guitar, for Elvis in the very early days and changed the world. And so that's how really we got started and when I heard that I knew that was what I was looking for and I hope and pray that it was the thing that uh, would help us to get Elvis started. And everybody listened to Dewey Phillips and everybody listened to WHBQ radio in Jackson because it came in 85 miles away like a local and they played a lot of music so all the kids uh, we all grew up listening to uh, WHBQ. And during the course of the evening, Sam Phillips walked in with this acetate of Blue Moon of Kentucky, and uh, that's all right, Mama. And uh, he asked Dewey to play it. And he said, Dewey, he said, I got an act here that is very unique and very unusual. You gotta listen to this guy. It's a white guy sounding black. And so Dewey put it on and listened to it, and Dewey told me, he said he thought it was a hit. He had a phrase, hey, Mother, that's a hit, that's a smash, you know. And uh, that was the way that whole thing uh, started. Of course, Dewey played one side, then the other, one side, then the other. Nobody, after he first played it, nobody listening would want to hear anything else. So when I heard Blue Moon of Kentucky and That's All Right Mama, and Dewey only played black records by black artists for white teenagers, I thought, well, he's got to be black. And Sam said, no, 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 he's, he's white. And then, of course, he walked into the mezzanine of the Chiska that night, and there he was. And that was the beginning of Presley Mania. Hearing her boyfriend's record on the radio was something Dixie Locke Emmons will never forget. The next day, I went to his house, and um, his mom and dad were there. He was at work, and so I, I was sitting out on the front porch with Gladys and Vernon waiting for Elvis to get home that day, and he, when I see him walking down uh, Alabama Street, and as soon as we made eye contact, you know, we both just started grinning because we were just, we were just ecstatic over his record. On July 30th, 1954, in a park in Memphis, Elvis made his first professional appearance, second build to Slim Whitman, the yodeling hillbilly. That little show at Overton Park Shell right here in Midtown Memphis, Tennessee, was a turning point in that man's career so far as his innate feeling toward whether or not people were going to love him, like him, and appreciate what he was giving them and doing his best to do it. He was probably more shocked than anyone with his success. I remember Pat Boone walking into um, the Godfrey show and he came in all excited and he says, I heard a record by this kid in Tennessee and he said, he, he, he has a hit there and we don't know about it here, but he said, wait, he said, this is the hottest thing I've ever heard. The first time I met Elvis, I was trying to, there was a little group of guys with him when he walked into the high school auditorium in Cleveland in 55. At that time, you know, Bill Randall was the number one DJ in the country and he brought me into the sock hop and, and he picked me up at the airport in Cleveland, I came in from New York. I had uh, my second record, Ain't That a Shame, was hitting. And, 
And he said, we've got another kid going to be on the show tonight with you on the, at the hop. I said, really, who? He said, Elvis Presley. And I'd seen his name on jukeboxes in Texas. But I said to Bill, well, hey, he's a hillbilly. You, you having him on, uh, on this thing tonight? He said, well, yeah. And he laughed. He said, he's coming up from Shreveport. And uh, he's been on uh, uh, Louisiana Hayride, I think. Right. And he says, but he's, he's been signed by uh, RCA, and I think he's going to be a big star. So we, I, I'm going to have him feature him on the show tonight with you. So the two of us were on the show right. that night in Cleveland. I had to follow him. Even though the audience didn't know who he was, he got him, you know. Yeah. And the uh, only time he lost a little bit was when in between records, he told you, thank you very much, I said, well, right. And, 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 and it sounded sort of like what he was. He was a boy from down south. Right. And in Cleveland, that was not in yet. Everything he did from then on was just like, you know, wow, look where he's at now. It was just a steady progression of, you know, popularity and, and um, his visibility on television was, it was exciting, of course. Bing Crosby, I've done many shows with Bing Crosby, benefits and things. And Bing came to see Elvis and came to see me. And I'm sitting with Bing Crosby, and he's watching this kid work before I went on, and uh, he says, going to be one of the biggest stars in show business. I said, what? What do you see that I don't see? I mean, I mean, I like the kid, but what do you see, Sashecki? He'll be one of the biggest stars in show business. So I said, okay. I saw him, he was on the back end of a, of a truck at some, at the Hub Motor Company, I believe it was, parking lot. And it was about, I don't know, 1,500 screaming kids and mostly girls hanging around there and uh, that's when he first had That's All Right Mama out. And uh, about a year later he came back to, to the fairgrounds there and sold out the place. And uh, That was a big deal. But I mean I think all kids who were, who were 16 and about, you know, like war babies as we were, I think we all loved Elvis's voice, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Buddy Holly too, I used to love. Well Elvis was, uh, he was a uh, larger than life character. He had uh, charisma just dripping off of him. First time we saw him uh, was in Lubbock, Texas when we were all teenagers. Uh, the first show uh, we did with him, he was wearing uh, white buck shoes, um, red pants, and an orange jacket. And he looked like a motorcycle headlight coming at you. And, um, and they had big, huge cotton bells. I'm talking about big, large, 500-pound cotton bells all around the stage to keep the girls away. And, um, and it looked like a real good career at the time, so I think that's one reason we got into it. But uh, Elvis was, uh, he was a tremendously uh, talented uh, individual, and we, we all loved him. I don't think there was any doubt anybody that knew Elvis, um, even from the very beginnings, that he would make it as a professional singer, um, because he had he had everything it took, you know, looks and rhythm and the voice and and everything that and the desire to do that. So I don't think there was any question in anybody's mind that he would make it. The big surprise I think for all of us was how the the immensity of it, the you know how it just. I don't think anybody ever imagined that uh, he would be as popular and uh, receive the recognition that he did. It was just a, a revolution overnight. When Elvis appeared, nobody knew what the hell happened to them. It, it had already happened to everybody. It just floored everybody. Just one short year after recording That's All Right Mama, this first ever color footage of Elvis was taken by a fan at a performance in Houston, Texas. Presley mania was spreading like wildfire. Well, uh, everything has happened to me so fast in the last year and a half till uh, uh, I'm all mixed up, you know. I mean, I can't keep up with everything that's happening. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley! <laughs> The fans were so excited, they were pulling things off the Cadillacs, and they were, like, going wild, and and, peop and the reporters ha were there covering everything. And they said, well, don't you get mad when, or angry when the fans tear everything up, or when they, you know, want to take things and, and, you know, just anything to be a part of you? And he said, no, they bought it for me, so they, you know, they can tear it up. One child, a small girl, uh, reached into her bodice and took out a piece of Kleenex. She opened it up 
She took her hand and scraped some dust off Elvis's car, put it in the, uh, in the Kleenex, and wrapped it up and then put it back in her bodice, and she walked away smiling, happy. She had achieved a, tro a trophy. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't believe that. The, 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 the hero worship uh, existed among the, that, that crowd. The evening of the concert was uh, another uh, eye-opener to me. I have never seen so many flash bulbs in my, in my, my life. The place was jammed, and uh, the, the audience itself was making so much noise that they couldn't even hear what the man was singing, uh, I thought. Uh, it was an absolutely spectacular event for me. I think the fan things were, were you know, it was, uh, like the Beatles thing that went on. I mean, this is just part of people are like that there, you know, and it's, it's very nice, but it's also, I think the important thing is what your, your contributions are, and I think it's important that you deliver. Elvis certainly could deliver, there's no question about that. Elvis comes on the radio and you're in a car, you can't just uh, keep on driving. You gotta pull over to the side. Hey, wait a minute, this could be dangerous, man. You know, this is, we're not fit to be driving in traffic. Let's just pull over to the side, listen to the song. It's only gonna be two and a half, three minutes long. It's AM radio. You know, all right, on, on we go. The song is over with. Elvis's unique style influenced budding young musicians all across America and eventually around the world. I was attending Abraham Lincoln High School in Brooklyn, New York, and um, I first saw Elvis on the Steve Allen Show, Ed Sullivan, and heard his records on, oh, Alan Freed and Murray the K, big disc jockeys in New York, and I was mesmerized. Uh, the, the sound of the voice, the charismatic way about him, the look, the, um, oh, the fact that it was a no-no at the beginning, you know, swinging the hips and what have you. That all added to the mystique. But uh, the ballad singing I thought was really incredible. The ballad singing was incredible. Uh, and being a writer, I admired the way he picked songs and the way he went into the studio with the demo records and did them, you know, really with, with a lot of energy, with a lot of uh, diligence being a, a natural musician. I think he bridged the gap between you know, rock and roll and, and whites and minorities. Uh, you know, Elvis Presley was probably the first uh, white person to get involved with the rock and roll thing. So I think he's a wonderful thing, Elvis Presley, a wonderful person. And to me, Elvis Presley was really the uh, uh, rock and roll phenomenon that was the uh, catalyst for my generation and your generation to uh, tune into blues music because that's what he was playing, you know, his early, early Sun recordings. He really just changed the, the face of music when he came out. You know, he made it all right to wiggle and, and shake your hips and, uh, and be sexual and sensual with, uh, with, with music and uh, still be a, a nice clean cut feller and, you know, some way or another, uh, he made that all come together and uh, pulled it off. When I was a young boy, uh, first songs I sung in public were Elvis. And the great thing about Elvis that he was he was mean and <laughs> mean and nasty <laughs> and so on. Uh, he wasn't the sort of person that your um, or sort of image maybe that your parents would approve of. I mean, obviously he was a nice, well-mannered Southern boy, or so we're told. But his image was really hard. You know, Cliff Richard when he started, he was really hard. But he he soon mellowed or had to mellow. For me, Elvis was the beginning of rock and roll. He's the one that uh, became the prototype. And I've always told the, uh, the press that if there had been no Elvis, then there could be no Cliff Richard. I don't think they would, there would have been no Beatles. I think rock and roll would have been here, but it would have been a different shape. Um, but Elvis to me was the king and always will remain the king. He was the one that taught us how to do it, really. And there were thousands of us when we were very young who wanted to grow up and be Elvis. And some of us were lucky, and people like myself, we managed to f have a career in rock and roll, which uh, I've certainly enjoyed over my 40 years. Of course, the first couple of records, like That's All Right, and uh, it started to filter through in England, you know? And, um, and I went to see Love Me Tender, and I think it basically um, changed my entire life uh, uh, in, in the way that it changed every uh, guy's life, uh, every kid's life, every boy's life, not to mention every girl's life. So um, 
And that's the thing, you know, I think that boys were just as attracted to this man as, uh, uh, as much as girls were. He was uh, very charismatic on stage. Um, he was very sexy. He was very handsome. Uh, there was something about him and a poignancy. I always saw the poignancy. And that's what always fascinated me about him. I um, felt that he had um, such charm, and that was the innocence that he showed, to, at least that I saw. And uh, that every mother wanted to take him and, and make him her little boy. And I felt that was what they did to uh, Frank Sinatra, too, when he was um, such a hit, you know, in the 40s. And uh, every woman wanted him to be either her son or her lover, I guess. <laughs> but it was one or the other. My mother was obsessed with Elvis, certainly. We had a cat called Elvis that had kittens. That was a stray. Um, I remember we had a record player, uh, and my father came in with a record one day and said, is this the one you wanted? And that was Heartbreak Hotel. And she said, oh, yes, yes, yes. And I remember my mother and my cousin, the one I was talking about before, Leela, they would be jiving her and John and Leela. I suppose it was a fairly new dance then, because before that they'd been listening to Eddie Cochran, Gene Vincent on radio, hadn't they? So this was, Elvis was bringing it right in. It was harder to get hold of, harder to hear. I don't know if they were smuggled in or what, but certainly um, they weren't freely available, were they, these records that uh, John and his friends and were keen to listen to, but Elvis was commercial. My mother certainly adored him, and I'm sure that John would have gone along with that anyway. When I was 16, Elvis is what was happening. A guy with long, greasy hair, wiggling his ass and singing Hound Dog and uh, That's All Right Mama on those early Sun records, which I think are his great period. But I do remember having an argument on stage with John. He wanted to play the Jailhouse Rock or something like that, and I wasn't very happy with that. The reason being, you see, the people who were keen on Skiffle were jazz fans, and they hated rock and roll. So if you played the wrong kind of music in front of the wrong audience, you were likely to be beaten up, right? So it wasn't that I was a folk purist. I was a coward. I just didn't want to be beaten up by all these people who hated rock and roll. For our folks, you know, none of them liked Elvis, our uh, mums and dads, and uh, the, the teachers and the priests, you know, they were all against him. I remember that before I even got a guitar, I, you know, I, I knew what, uh, I'd heard Heartbreak Hotel. So I, I'm playing my violin, which I'd played for 10 years in the in orchestras and things. And I, I was playing it this way and tuned it up as a guitar, the first four strings of a guitar in the youth club. And I'm going to Heartbreak Hotel, so smile, baby, with me. And uh, the, the youth club leader says, get out, don't ever come back. I mean, it was just this, we were worse than uh, layabouts. We were. We were an anti-thema to anybody who was part of the British establishment at that time. Elvis is the rebel, the dark stranger who comes in the night and seduces the women, plays at a little juke joint, or plays on a hillside, or is a Greek, Greek myth of Dionysus. He's Dionysian, just like Jim Morrison is. And he plays his songs, and he may be in league with the devil, or he may be an angel. To the women, you know, it's that old song, you know. He's a devil with the women, but they all call him a saint. Well, some cats got it, and uh, some cats ain't. And that's Elvis, and he had it, and he was irresistible. I was about seven, and um, I heard on TV Elvis singing, so I went into the television room, and my sister was on the floor screaming and pulling her socks and pulling her hair. And I was going, what is she doing that for? And my father came in and was quite disgusted, so he switched off the television set. So I immediately fell in love with Elvis Presley because I thought, how great to make the dad come in and switch it off. And I remember um, Don't Be Cruel in particular because when he went, mm -hmm, it made me feel 
this sexual feeling, which at eight years old was kind of unusual to feel. But he turned me on at eight, turned me on. Um, I then carried on a great love affair with Elvis all the way through my life, right the way through the army, the big TV special he did coming back. And uh, he was just always my favorite voice, my favorite performer, my favorite look. I mean, he's... <clears throat> Everybody wanted to be Elvis Presley. That was the American dream. I wanted to be a rock and roll star because I listened to Elvis and I saw Elvis and I said, gee, wouldn't that be something? And here, a little Pishika from Brooklyn, New York, classical pianist. I started writing these rock and roll songs and he was definitely an inspiration to me. That energy and that restlessness and that kind of thing that he, that persona, he took that on stage and then you added the great songs and the great band and the great music. And it was, you know, it was a spiritual awakening every time that, that you had an opportunity to see him. And I think that's why it was so impossible to get to see him. Um, and all the fans that did, it's a great, you know, it's a great gift he gave us all. I couldn't compete with that. And I didn't even try because I would sit on a stool, play folk guitar and sing. I couldn't move like that on stage. None of us could. We didn't know how to do that. He was a natural performer on stage. He did what he had to do. When he sang Love Me Tender or Are You Lonesome Tonight, he kept, you felt like, even if you were a guy, you felt almost embarrassed that he was singing this girl and you were over here, you were eavesdropping. You were, it was that intimate. Don't Be Cruel and, and, and the early Elvis records are amazing. I mean, those records, are you lonesome tonight? I mean, there's nothing more romantic and more beautiful and more, more moment that was taken to, to a record note where you felt the scene in that movie right on that wax. Elvis rode the wave of Presley mania as best he could, making an indelible mark on records, radio, television, and motion pictures. His punishing movie schedule kept him from live performing which eventually led to dissatisfaction and restlessness. Here's this guy that was from Memphis, from, where was he from before that? He was a truck driver, he was just an ordinary guy. And then all of a sudden he got this, all this money and all this fame and it blows your mind. I mean, it sure just blew his mind all the time. He was like buying Cadillacs for all his friends. He couldn't handle it and I totally understand it. It's not, it takes you right out of reality. And I think that's what he was. And then not only was he out of reality, but he was in Hollywood making movies. Motion pictures, they make you, they put you into a mold, I think, and try to form you into something maybe that you're not really quite as a human being. I think his forte really was on stage. I mean, he just had that rapport with an audience and could really knock him dead. That's why he stopped making movies. And when his contracts are over, he told the colonel one time, he says, when these contracts are over, I don't want to make any more movies for a while. I want to get away from it. And Colonel said, fine. So he didn't sign any more pictures. And, and pictures, the movies weren't doing as well either. They were not, you know, doing as, as good as they were before. Things were dying off. His career was a little slower. The music was slower. Uh, it was not as big as he was at that time. So I think he knew he needed change too. In 1968, what came to be known as the Comeback Special saw an uncertain Elvis once again performing before a live audience. In the very beginning, and the reason that Elvis balked at doing the special in the first place is because I thought he had lost confidence, which most artists do at one time in their life. And I thought he was afraid. In fact, I think he expressed it to me. He didn't think he had it anymore for the audience because he had been taken away from that live audience for so many years making those movies. Elvis knew that's where he wanted to be. I mean, that's what Elvis loved to do more than anything in the world is perform live on stage. And that's how he started playing little clubs and little dates and stuff like that. And I mean, recording sessions were fun, but it's not the same feel you get from the audience. And any entertainer that's a performer in front of a live audience would tell you there's nothing, no feeling in the world like it. And Elvis has said it many times. You feel the love from the audience. You feel electricity. It makes you come alive. And that's why he said that's his favorite thing to do. And that's why he would always do it. He didn't talk about acting because he was past that at that time. He hadn't done a film in a while and he was really into performing at the Hilton. I think that was his great love, performing in front of an audience live. He enjoyed that. Uh, I just missed it. I, I, I miss the, uh, the, uh, the closeness of, a, of an audience, of a live audience. 
And there was one other factor pushing Elvis towards a return to live performing. I think one of the things that, that helped Elvis want to get back on stage and get back touring again was he and Tom Jones became very good friends. I mean very good friends. And he'd see Tom doing his act up there. Well, he thought, well, I can do mine, <laughs> you know. I'm sure he thought that, even though he never expressed it that way. He told me that I gave him confidence to make a comeback because he hadn't done any live shows for a long time. And I think with the, the British invasion, with a lot of the groups like the Beatles and the Stones, and, um, he didn't know whether his style of music would still be popular. So when I came on the scene, it reassured him that a solo singer could still, you know, could still make it, could still get hit records. I met Elvis um, first in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, I think I was appearing with Tom Jones and he came backstage to say hello to Tom or we went to his dressing room to say hello. When Elvis used to play in, in Vegas, he would sing at the Hilton and I would be at Caesar's Palace. And uh, when sometimes we would overlap, he would finish his engagement and then he would come and see my shows. I do remember Elvis coming over to Caesar's Palace one night to see Tom. He sat way in the back. He had a cap on. He, he just didn't want to interfere in Tom's performance by being recognized and having people run to him. And I think Tom felt the same way. They were both very, very hot at the same time. And I know how it would be for Tom to walk into an Elvis performance or Elvis to walk into a Tom performance. The audience would be certainly distracted and they would run for autographs and run to take pictures. And uh, it's not fair to the guy on stage who's performing. Elvis and Tom were comfortable around each other. There, there was no jealousy, no animosity. They both appreciated each other's talents, which is it's great when you find another entertainer like that. Elvis's new visibility allowed many fellow performers who had admired him from afar to get to know their hero. My career has taken me all over the world. I used to sing in various languages. And wherever I go, fans will invariably ask me, did you know Elvis? Did you ever meet him? I had the pleasure of meeting Elvis once at the Las Vegas Hilton, right here in town. He invited my wife, Liba, and I to one of his shows, and uh, it was spectacular. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget, there was a chorus of about seven or eight people on stage, and um, he was, gives 110%. He really was a very dynamic performer. He invited us backstage afterwards and gave my wife a scarf, and she still has it to this day, a beautiful scarf. And there was a piano in his dressing room. And I forget what song it was, but I played a gospel song and the two of us sang, and I played the piano. I wish I had a tape recorder. It was, <laughs> it was, it was marvelous. And then I had the thrill of having an Elvis record. He did my song called Solitaire on the Memphis album. And that was a great thrill. I was lucky enough to first meet Elvis um, at his house in Bel Air. And he used to invite uh, different artists, singers, and uh, musicians to come and jam with him at his house. In the basement, we had a jukebox, or in the lower room, we had a jukebox, and uh, just played records and, and uh, sang together and just had a, a great time. I sang with Elvis Presley a lot, but we never recorded together. We used to sing in, uh, in the hotel suite, uh, or in his house. He, had, he rented a house in Hawaii which I stayed at, at uh, in 69, and we sang, you know, most of one evening together. Uh, so it was great, you know, singing with Elvis, and, and our ranges are very similar, you know, we would sing in the, in the same key, so it wasn't like trying to sing with somebody that, that had a much lower voice or a much higher voice, you know, the, uh, we would sing in the, in the same keys. So it was, very, it was very natural to sing with Elvis Presley. But um, I never recorded with him because we were recording on different labels, we were over in Hawaii, and we'd go uh, on the other side, the windward side, and, and rent a house. And we, uh, we had gone to see Tom in, uh, in a concert at, at uh, the Itakai Hotel. So we rode the house and invited Tom over there. So Joe goes over and gets Tom. And uh, he came over there, got in his bathing suit. There's Elvis and Tom laying on the beach, 
Because the people on the Windward Tide, the island people, don't bother people. And so there's Tom Jones and Elvis land on the beach talking, having a good time. So he stayed till two o'clock in the morning. He was just like a typical tourist. So that became his favorite getaway spot. And we spent many, many vacations there over the years. And that was a place that when Elvis got off that airplane, all the weight off his shoulders became, he became relaxed and he had a ball. He just had a loving time. And uh, if you see any pictures from the Hawaii days, you'll see he always had a smile on his face. The adventures of Tom Jones and Elvis Presley weren't limited to just Hawaii. When Tom Jones came off stage, he was wringing wet. I mean, soaked right through his clothes. And we would jump in the limousine and drive, you know, because I rode with him. Uh, it would be Tom, myself, his conductor. We'd jump in the limo, and uh, I always waited for him. You know, after the show, we had the car with the door open and the motor running. I know it was the same with Elvis. They'd have to rush him right out of the, the nightclub or the theater, wherever it was. So somebody had given, given him a song, and he thought that it would be good for me. So he came to Caesar's Palace, and he was in the, uh, in the dressing room, and I came off stage and I was sweating a lot. And he said, I've got this song for you. And I said, okay, let me get in the shower first. I have to have a shower and then I'll, I'll hear it. So when I was in the shower washing my hair, I hear Elvis Presley's voice. And he was leaning over the shower door. He couldn't wait for me to, to come out. So he was actually singing to me in the shower. So I thought, you know, who would ever believe that Elvis Presley was <laughs> singing to me in the shower? And it's true. Despite his heavy touring and performing schedule, Elvis found time to lend a word of encouragement to up-and-coming talent. I got a note from him one time. Uh, years ago, we did a version of Jailhouse Rock on a Fandango, another half-live, half-studio album. And uh, he said, don't ever do that again. No, he, <laughs> he said uh, he enjoyed the version, so... Uh, I kept, I kept the note. I formed my own band at 14, and I did lots of Elvis songs. One of my big early songs was uh, Jailhouse Rock. I used to bring the, bring the house down with that. And then after I had my first success on my first, well, actually, Can the Can was the first record. And on that album, I recorded All Shook Up. Elvis heard it, and he invited me over to Graceland to meet him. Um, and I got really, really nervous because to meet my hero was, <gasps> so I said, no, I didn't go. I didn't go to meet him, which is really stupid. Um, he said, I'd like to meet you, Susie, because your version of All Shook Up is the best I've heard since my own. But I didn't go like an idiot. I was 16 years old and I <clears throat> go to the mailbox and I open up this letter and there's a note from Elvis Presley to me. My first record was called Halfway to Paradise. And the note was very small, simple, and to the point. It just said, Dear Tony, I love the record, Halfway to Paradise. In fact, it's in my jukebox. Best regards, Elvis. I felt like I just got the Congressional Medal of Honor. I, I felt as though, uh, I mean, I felt, I felt like Moses at the burning bush. <laughs> I mean, I felt vindicated and blessed by the king. I mean, it was amazing. It was amazing. Uh, it, was the, it was the main piston to my engine as a performer to continue the ride. He um, made you feel like you were, were all the same here. And I think that really was an incredible catalyst for me. I mean, I could have just then gone back and married this guy at the gas station in the valley where I lived, and that would be the end of it. But I went, no, 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 wait. You're working with Elvis Presley, and he thinks that you guys are alike, so maybe if he can do it, you can do it. So that something like that, it's a subliminal, subconscious, incredible um, influence he had on me. He was a cool guy. He was a great guy. Laughed, you know, easy laugh, nice guy. But uh, you always felt intimidated to be around him because everybody was hanging, you know, everybody's afraid he's going to say the wrong thing to him and he's going to have to deck you <laughs> or whatever. Or at least you felt that way. So uh, we really never talked much about music or anything. and. Uh, I'm sure that Elvis was happy for me. I think he was the kind of guy that, that uh, enjoyed other people's success, especially if he had something to do with it. And, you know, I never tried to ride his coattails or anything, but uh, uh, I've always given him credit for all the good things that have happened in my life. I think that Elvis's gift, outside of his great talent, was his 
uh, uh, purpose of intent or his intent of purpose, intent of purpose. Uh, if he were talking to you, he was really talking to you. If we were singing a song, it, we just didn't pass it by and somebody could get his attention. And he would just lock into whatever he was doing. You know, if he were giving you a kiss, it was that, he, he did that with that kind of in, intensity. He was real gracious. He drove me all around Graceland in a golf cart and was showing me, uh, you know, the horses, the stuff, the things, the trailer where he lived when they, you know, whatever. And uh, I think it was uh, Lisa Marie's second birthday party. So I just remember him every time we would go into some amazing great room, beautiful gold trophies, stuff, things. And I say, wow, man, this is amazing. Every room he would say, yeah, Bill, they've really been rough on me, man. They've really been rough on me. And I said, yeah, they're killing you. And so when he came to see me at the Sands Hotel, I had a dressing room that was like this. And he walked in, he looked at me, he said, yeah, Bill, they, they've really been rough on you, man. <laughs> I first met him uh, playing football at Coldwater Canyon Park in Beverly Hills. And uh, we, we, we used to play just about every Sunday, you know, or Saturday. And uh, I remember one game when uh, we are playing and Red West was opposite me on the line. And the ball was snapped and Red picked me up and moved me over three feet. And, and I protested, I said, I thought this was touch football. You know, and then uh, Elvis said, put Jimmy and me opposite each other on the line, you know, because we were on opposing teams. And um, when the ball was snapped, Elvis uh, just looked up at me and said, so what are you working on now? <laughs> Neither one of us moved, you know, we were into football. We were talking about, about careers at that point. If I ever had anybody that I ran into, I would say it was a brother. It was definitely be Elvis Presley. I met outside your own brothers, you know. Elvis, Elvis was definitely one of those. You saw him, he was always the same. He was always congenial, nice. He was just a nice guy. He was exactly what he was on stage. He was exactly what he was when he was off stage. He was, he wasn't any, anybody to, to be eshy. He was, uh, if he told you a hog weighed five pounds, you could wrap it up. If he told you anything weighed five pounds, you could wrap it up. Unfortunately, colossal fame can have its drawbacks, sometimes with tragic consequences. He couldn't go out, you know, and, and if he did go out, he literally had to take all of his people with him uh, because something could or would happen, you know, and it was an unfortunate thing. So the crowd, the crowd attracted a crowd, you know what I mean? It was, it was kind of one of those things, and, uh, and he looked like he was in living color anyway. It wasn't like he was going to be able to walk through the casino and nobody see him. You know, I, if Bobby and I weren't together, I could go walk around. You know, maybe somebody would say, aren't, aren't you? And I would say, no. <laughs> and uh, so I always felt bad, you know, that, that he never, you know, that he was kind of, it's good news and the bad news, man. Good news, you're Elvis Presley. Bad news is you're Elvis Presley. You know, you can't do, can't do much. I think reality was missing in his life. I think he was, he was so removed from what was going on. I mean, I heard a story once that he was working here at the Hilton and that he left Graceland in his pajamas, got in a limousine, went to his private airplane, got on the plane in his pajamas, flew to Las Vegas, got off the airplane into a limousine in his pajamas, came to the back door, went up an elevator to his room in his pajamas, never got out of his pajamas all day. and. No question, that's a luxury. I guess it's a nice way to travel, but it's not, re it's not reality. A harsh reality set in for everyone on August 16th, 1977. What happened was my musical director, the man that used to do all my music for me, he died of a heart attack. His name was Johnny Spence. And I had to go to his funeral in Los Angeles. And while I was doing a press conference to say I had to stop my shows to go to my musical director's funeral, I was coming out of the press conference and my road manager said, Elvis Presley just died. 
So one day he was you know, my very close friend, and the next day you know, another close friend, Elvis Presley. So it was one thing after the other. It was, uh, so I was in a state of shock. Uh, he was unique. And I think uh, the charisma that he had with his fans was, uh, was something else. It's too bad he didn't realize how much he was loved. And I always visit, every time I go to Memphis, I always come and go in uh, Graceland. It's always a kick. It's always very special. The tour is great, and I always weep when I get to the grave sites. Always weep. I don't, you know, when was it? In the 50s, the late 50s, that he really began his career, and those who were his fans then are still his fans to this day. And then there's a legion of brand new people who discover his music and they become almost as religious as his first fans about their feelings towards him. He's still the king. I still don't understand uh, this uh, idolatry that's going on, this, uh, this godlike thing that's happening. This, well, charisma he had, but this godlike thing, and then that's all marketing. I mean, I'm sure if he was living right now, he wouldn't believe this. That Graceland and people waiting and they're forming a church called the Elvis Church and this thing. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. The public's continuing adoration of all things Elvis has led to Presley imitators of all shapes and sizes. But there is one man who would be king who stands apart from the pack. It's, it's not just an impersonation. It's not that I'll come on stage and I'll act like Elvis or mimic word for word everything he says. The, the only time I'm really into portraying Elvis is when I'm singing. When I'm not singing, it's me. It's me and uh, there's a lot going on. There's comedy going on, you know, there's magic, and there's the illusion. Uh, there are times where we create the illusion, like during If I Can Dream. Uh, people, when they're watching that segment, they're, they're experiencing an illusion. They're, it's like they're really watching uh, you know, Elvis, they let their mind take them there, you know? I, I don't really do much. I just do what I love and, you know, I'm singing. But I can see the illusion happening. I can see it happening. It's amazing. I think he was timeless. Elvis was timeless. And the fans today, the little kids, love it. The older people who grew up with it love it. I think the reason was that he was a dedicated, serious artist, and a lot of people uh, didn't realize that during his career, but if you look at the great body of work, uh, the recordings, the movies, the television shows, uh, there was a, a dedication, very serious uh, artist. That is a voice, unique, is that class of artists then has a legacy for history. Elvis is everything. He's a voice, he's a style, he's a survivor. He's one of the greatest singers in history between him, Sinatra, and, and Nat King Cole. There's not really five people that you can put your fingers on that really changed the course of American music. You know, certainly Elvis is one of them, the Beatles, Michael Jackson, people like that. And but but I think that it's it that's what made him so special. Not so much that he was a great singer or a great entertainer or great thing, but he really had a vision for what he wanted to do with music. I think that he just had a wonderful spirit that will live forever. That he was kind and besides being having the most beautiful voice. Just even today, it's hard to beat his voice. And he, he just, he was magic. The, everything about him was magic. When I was at the Hilton, I had that, I called it the Elvis Suite. The top floor of that, uh, of that hotel was the Elvis Suite with all the bedrooms and the game room with the uh, pinball machines and that fabulous terrace all over, all around. I said, gee, Elvis was here. Elvis was really here, and I have the same dressing room. That's great. That's a great thrill. When you were with Elvis, there was a magic and a special quality about him that you knew he was above and beyond all other performers, you know? He just had a very, very unique quality that made him who he is, you know? And that's why he's, he's the great star. That's why he's the great image, and that's why he'll live on forever and ever. I think about him 
quite a bit. But when I think of him, I don't think of him as Elvis Presley, that image, the star. I think of him as Elvis Presley, the guy that I played football with. He's with me all the time. I always dedicate at least one song to him on stage. And all the way through my career, my 36 year long career, his name comes up with me all the time. So bless you, Elvis. Wish you were still here, but he's not. And uh, I will never step on his blue suede shoes. I'm sure if he was alive, I mean, if he, uh, he would still be making music. You know, he felt the same way. He, when he started recording over the years, uh, he changed. You know, he, he listened to a lot of different music and he recorded all kinds of music. And I think he would still be doing that. You know, he would move forward if he was alive today. As evidence of Elvis's never ending popularity, the Guinness Book of World Records declared the 16 part definitive Elvis collection released in July of 2002, the longest video documentary ever made about anyone. That same month, a remix of Elvis's 1968 song, A Little Less Conversation, shot straight to number one on Billboard's Hot Singles chart, and three months later, the King topped the Billboard charts once again, this time with a CD featuring 30 of his number one hits. 25 years after his passing, and nearly half a century after he strolled into Sun Studios to record That's All Right Mama, Elvis managed to surpass such current favorites as Peter Gabriel, Eminem, and the Dixie Chicks. And here's how big Elvis Presley is. Elvis Presley has sold more records since his death than he did when he was alive. I meant uh, how big his name is and how big the, uh, the awe is and the aura around that sur surround an Elvis Presley. And he, he, I don't think anybody will ever catch him as far as, he's, he's like a hundred million albums ahead of his closest pursuer or sewer, I think, as far as albums sold. You know, I sold 42, 43 million albums, and I thought that was pretty good. I mean, I'll take that, mind you. But, I, you know, you look at Elvis, he's probably up to 300 million albums now. But thank God for the records and the television and the movies, you know, because they, they go on forever, and people love to, to, to see that. It's a great legacy.